Cicerone. Hello and welcome to Footnotes, the Cicerone podcast, a podcast to inspire you about outdoor travel and activities in the UK and across the world. I'm Hannah and you can email me with your thoughts or your questions on live at cicerone.co.uk. I'm here today with Maddie Williams. She's Cicerone's operations director and she's been active in the outdoors since she was a little child. At the age of 11, she hiked the Tour of Mont Blanc and she's done quite a lot of horse riding in interesting places, notably Kyrgyzstan, Namibia and Mongolia. Hi Maddie. Hello, thanks very much for having me on. I should probably add that I was supervised when I did the Tour of Mont Blanc at 11. Yeah, that would have been like some sort of record. <laughs> it wasn't. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't quite that impressive. <laughs> you might have made the news. But you're here today to talk about your recent adventure. Followers of our social media channels will have seen that you did the Camino. When we say the Camino, we've brought this up a couple of times on the podcast. There are lots and lots and lots of Caminos, but there is one that is usually called the Camino that people refer to. And that's the Camino Frances. And that's what you did, wasn't it? Yes, that's right. So the Camino Frances is the most popular route and is generally what's referred to as the the Camino by people who might not be as aware that there are dozens of other routes. And in my case, I, I chose that particular route for the trip that I did quite recently because more than any of the other routes, it was most likely to be doable in winter. Yeah, so you recently joined Cicerone as the operations director and you took a bit of a gap between jobs to go off and do the Camino. The timing of it was unusual. When when did you arrive? I suppose so. It's not often that you actually have the length of time available to go off and do a four or five week trek. But because of my recent sort of change of careers, I had the time it wasn't exactly the best time, but um, you have to go with what you've got. So I actually set off a few days after Christmas in 2021 and uh, completed basically the entirety of the walk in January. Where does it start and finish? So typically uh, you can start it um, pretty much anywhere on the, on the length of it. Typically it starts in a town in France, in the French Pyrenees called Saint-Jean-Pierre-de-Port. Unfortunately for me, at the time, due to uh, COVID closures, France wasn't letting any British nationals into the country unless they had a suitably compelling reason. And I didn't think that my chances of convincing them to start the Camino was a compelling reason. So I actually started basically the next available spot along the route, just over uh, the border into Spain at a monastery called Rontes Bayes. The end is obviously... uh, in Santiago de Compostela, but I also did a a little bit more and went over to the sea to Fistera and Munchia. When you hike the Camino, you get a pilgrim passport. If you get enough stamps, then you can go and get your certificate at the end. And you only actually have to do, is it 100 kilometres to get the certificate? But if you start at Saint-Jean or anywhere further than that, you just get more stamps. So how was it getting your pilgrim stamps? Because normally this is quite a busy pilgrimage and you, you've got a whole cohort of people that you're walking with. You've got tons and tons of options for accommodation. Were you really struggling to get your pilgrim passport stamped? That's a really interesting question. Often when you have a look at these pilgrim passports, they say, try and get two stamps a day. But really, that's only absolutely necessary in the final 100 kilometres after a town called Saria. If I had needed to get two stamps a day earlier in the trek, that, that just wouldn't have been able to happen because it was winter. And because I started basically in the middle of the holiday sort of period between Christmas and New Year, There was very little open. I managed to get one stamp a day, and that's because that was in the the albergue or the hostel that I was staying in. But finding anywhere else open en route throughout the entirety of the day often just didn't happen. So uh, it was just as well that you only needed one a day at earlier points in the trip. Yeah, so interestingly, in all our Cicerone books, we always sort of talk about when the best time to go might be. And often the best time to go is spring, summer or autumn. For loads of our books, they're the the sort of sensible times to go. But there are plenty of books where you can do some walking in the winter. 
but there are always going to be more difficulties. So like you said, it's there's not as many people there because there's not as many people there. There's not as many businesses open. So you didn't get the sort of experience of having breakfast and then walking for a little bit and having second breakfast and then walking a bit more and having a coffee and then walking a bit more and having lunch. So how did you manage with getting meals and, and stuff during the day? Oh, if you make that sound so idyllic, just, <laughs> just going from cafe to cafe, having a nice sort of cup of tea or a cool, refreshing drink. Yeah, I'm afraid it wasn't like that for me. If food is actually a really interesting question because on the Camino, particularly, I think, doing it in winter, your requirements and, and your needs and what you're thinking about really, really co- sort of condenses down into the essentials. Where am I going to sleep? What am I going to eat? You know, am I, am I healthy and able to continue? So once you've got those basics, you're okay. I'd say I never sort of ran out of food. There was always a shop open somewhere, and it just took a little more thinking ahead and preparation to understand, actually, at this albergue that I'm going to be staying out, they don't do breakfast. So I'm going to get another bit of bread right now or whatever I it might have been on offer. So I have something to eat tomorrow morning before I set off. I generally try to have about a meal's worth of food sort of in reserve um, at any one time. Sometimes like I would end up eating my reserve, but uh, that's kind of what it was there for. I'm making that sound really quite dramatic. It didn't feel difficult to sort of manage or do at the time. Um, It was just a matter of if there's a bakery or something open, I probably would stop in and get something. Being able to actually see like an open cafe or or something like that ended up feeling like a, a sort of a hidden gift along the way instead of something to expect and rely on. So, you know, actually... There were a few times when I did get second breakfast and it was just a wonderful thing. And I could sit down and have a nice cup of tea, get a croissant. And it was it was an addition and a sort of a nice part of the day instead of something that I could realistically rely on. But it did take you a little bit more planning to to think about where you were going to stop for lunch. Definitely. So planning sort of both before I left and kind of planning on the route became far more important. I've talked with with many people kind of before I left and since who have done the Camino in spring or summer. And from what it sounds like, it was a very different experience for them than it was for me. So it was, yeah, a very different experience to what might have been a typical pilgrim's experience, simply because um, I really needed to think through where I was actually going to be staying that night. And did I actually have a bed? I would be phoning ahead to make sure that uh, the albergue was going to be open and that I could stay there. Usually pilgrims can just turn up or would end up having to queue and reservations aren't really allowed. And they certainly were in winter because people running the hostels were needed to know if they needed to have pilgrims that uh, they were looking after. Yeah, I was going to ask about the accommodation. Again, normally the the Camino Frances which is the the Camino that you did, is so well provided for that you can be really flexible about how much walking you want to do. You can change your plans quite last minute. But for you, did it remove an element of flexibility? In some respect, yes. So there was always somewhere to stay, but sometimes that choice was essentially made for you in terms of where the open albergue was going to be. I remember, for example... The first stage after Burgos, I sort of wanted to be able to get to a a town called Hontanas, which was going to be about 25, 27 kilometers out of Burgos. Unfortunately, for that week, that albergue had been shut. And the alternative was either going to be like an additional 10k beyond that. And it was going to be about a 40 kilometer day. Or there was another one open that was going to be about seven kilometers before Hontanas um, at a place called Ornios del Camino. So that, that decision was made for me. That was where I needed to get to because that was what was available. That turned out to be a lovely little albergue, actually. Um, the rest of the village was completely closed up for the winter. So there was no shop open, no bar open. But the albergue itself had a sort of communal meal 
and breakfast sort of set out for the, the, the next day. So it was more difficult in terms of being able to have the flexibility of going where you wanted to go, deciding at the spur of a moment, actually, I think we'll call it a day here and stay at this albergue en route. It required a bit more planning, especially to make the sort of the longer sections between sort of major cities divide up into sort of sensible length stages. What I will say is that there was plenty of information available about what albergues were going to be open. They make sure to keep things sort of up to date. Telephone numbers are always sort of, you can always tell if something's going to be open or not uh, with a, a sort of a quick check. And I got quite good at asking, is the albergue open tomorrow in Spanish? So uh, at least my Spanish was picked up as well. Another thing that people say about the Camino is that it's really sociable. And how was that different in the winter? How many people did you see? That's an interesting one because it was social for me. Luckily, I was not the only solo traveller who thought that walking the Camino in the depths of winter was a good idea. There were a whole bunch of us who also thought that it was going to be a sort of month well spent. So there was a lot of a social aspect with um, obviously very like-minded people because a lot of people walk the Camino, but not many people decide that January is the time to do it. Um, So there was the shared experience kind of built in already. What was probably different to the usual sort of summer experience was that we would often spend the entire day walking sort of alone and solo and then sort of meet up again in the evening and compare stories about what what the day had brought us. So we had camaraderie and that type of communal experience. Was there a group of you at the end at the cathedral getting your credentials together? Um, there was actually. So unfortunately, the the sort of group that I'd spent a fair bit of time with uh, ended up scattering a little after Leon. But when I actually arrived in Santiago, there was a mini reunion of all sorts of people who I hadn't seen in either days or even weeks. And so that was an unexpected benefit. You don't know who's going to crop up in Santiago. And when you turn up in the great square before the cathedral and suddenly someone you hadn't seen in like a 10 days is sort of standing there and ready to say hello again. Didn't you get recognised? <laughs> this is the randomest story. <laughs> it was very strange. So I arrived in Pamplona. It was New Year's Eve, sort of lunchtime-ish, and uh, the, the streets were sort of crowded with people kind of enjoying a bit of lunch. And I, I was wandering around thinking, of trying to find some food myself. And then I heard a voice behind me going, Madeline, Madeline Williams. And I stopped in my tracks. And this, uh, this, this older lady came up to me and said, Madeline. And I was like, how do you know my name? It was a, it was a very strange experience. And it turned out it was the uh, proprietor of the albergue I was going to be staying at. And clearly I was going to be the only sort of British girl staying there that night. And I must have stuck out like a sore thumb on this Pamplona street to be so recognisable <laughs> as random English pilgrim. Uh, that is funny. You don't expect to hear someone shouting your name in, in a foreign country. No, no, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so what was the weather like on the Camino in winter? That's a good question. And I'd done quite a lot of research before to uh, to prepare myself and to get make sure I had the right kit for the experience. So um, I, I know the, the Cicerone guidebook, for instance, has sort of temperature and precipitation tables. So I was like, OK, it's going to rain. I could go online and do some research and, you know, there would be pictures of some of the high points on the trail, like the uh, Osobrero and the Cruz de Ferro, and they'd be covered in snow. I thought, okay, it's going to rain, there's going to be snow, there's going to be ice, it's going to be cold. I need to sort of make sure that I'm re- ready for anything, basically. And then I got there and I had a week of perfect sunshine. Not even a week, it was a month of perfect sunshine. I can't <laughs> explain it. I can't rationalise it. It was completely unheard of and just an absolute wonderful weather. Every day was bright sunshine and blue skies for as far as the eye could see. 
and it was wonderful. It was cold, though. I will not deny that it got very, very cold. It was quite often that you'd be starting the day and it would be about minus six. So the kit was an important factor because I needed to be warm enough. But um, no, there wasn't snow. There wasn't rain. There wasn't ice. You didn't need to take crampons or anything like that? thing is, I actually did. They're, they're not real crampons. They're kind of miniature little sort of spikes that you can kind of slip over your boots. Oh, the micro spikes. Micro spikes. And I found a set which were only going to be 100 grams. I'm not going to start talking about the levels of detail I went into my packing and planning because it just got a bit ridiculous. Eventually, I thought I'm going to take them 100 grams as something that I'm happy to carry in the event that I need to, because if it really is difficult underfoot, these little spikes are going to save the day. So they're the only bit of kit that I didn't use, but I'm glad that I took them anyway. So we've talked about quite a lot of the differences doing the Camino in winter as opposed to a more usual time. But some things never change. And I hear that blisters were still an affliction. Ah, yes. A bit of a running joke amongst the uh, other pilgrims and I was um, that our Caminos should have been sponsored by Compede. Everyone had blisters. Literally everyone. (laughs) I was relatively lucky. I think I only got two after particularly long and difficult days. But uh, some of the others, oh, there's always something to talk about on the Camino. And invariably, it's the state of people's feet, which <laughs> is is terrible, terrible. And only really happens when everyone is put, putting their feet through pressure and distance that they're really not used to at all. So, yes, I, I think I was still relatively lucky. Bit of bit of foot maintenance and compede uh, and so was, saw me right as rain. But um, <laughs> other blister brands are available, of course. <laughs> other brist- blister brands are available. I'd swear there are more pharmacies per sort of population along the Camino than anywhere else in Spain, and every single one of them was stocked with an assortment of foot care products that you would never believe from a tiny regional village pharmacy. It was, um, well, it's sort of ind- indicative of the, the level of facility and focus on the pilgrimage that everywhere on the route actually uh, ends up being orient- orientated to. So there is that. Yeah, that's always going to happen. I mean, it's such a it's such a thing to put your feet through. How many days were you walking? I think there was a, probably about 30 days of worth of walking. Um, I had some rest days thrown in and unfortunately was, was a bit unwell in the middle of uh, the trip itself. But 30 days of, of where all you're actually going to be doing is walking is something that you just don't do. I was quite conscious, uh, particularly at the start, to try and plan relatively short days to kind of warm up to the the trail itself. Th- this is the definition of a marathon, not a sprint in many ways. And if you try to, to go too far too soon, I think you'd end up just ruining your feet or your knees or, or your back or, or something. And to be honest, that did happen quite a lot with other pilgrims along the way. Until, ooh, probably up until Burgos, I would say there was about a 50% dropout rate. Wow. Some of that was, you know, voluntary. People only actually had a sort of small length of time that they were going to be walking anyway. But most of it was injury related. Trying immediately to go from a sort of relatively sedentary, normal existence into spending your entire day walking, it can really sort of take it out of you. So I don't know what the the normal statistics in over sort of summer months might be for kind of injuries and dropouts, but because it was winter and because you would end up knowing everyone else on the trail with you, uh, it was very noticeable when when you lost another one. I'm making that sound very dramatic, losing another one. Yeah, that did sound really dramatic. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> like like you said, you 
even if you're preparing for a trip like this, you maybe try and get the mileage up at the weekends. But most people, they're doing a full-time job. Most work these days is desk-based. You know, you're sitting at a desk for eight, nine hours a day most of the time, even if you have quite active weekends. It's still a big change to go from, all right, well, I'm a bit of a weekend warrior to I'm going to walk for 30 days straight. Absolutely. It's a real shock to the system. And so, yes, like, as you said, I did sort of up the mileage at the weekends, but pretty much the only other um, preparation uh, I would do, I'm not going to call it training because it doesn't really qualify, was to wear a kind of loaded rucksack on my daily dog walks. That was it. But even that really, really helped because it just accustomed me to the additional weight to the additional pressure that would be on my feet. Walking every day with a dog certainly does actually help get you kind of walking fit, but it doesn't really prepare you as much for walking day after day after day. That took the trail to actually kind of get me used to. And it took about two weeks before things started feeling better (laughs) instead of worse. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And then by the time that you're sort of fully settled into it and you're used to that life, then you, you finish. You get to Santiago and you think, yeah. oh, hell, what next? And and it doesn't surprise me at all that so many people go, all right, I'm just going to walk for a bit longer and, and delay that decision of what next. I'll go to Finisterre, then I'll think about it. <laughs> I mean, absolutely. Although it's interesting. I'm Some people obviously do the, the Camino for sort of religious and spiritual reasons. Um, I don't think I really qualify But I was expecting Santiago to feel like the other big cathedral cities along the route, Pamplona, Burgos, Leon. But when I got there, it felt definitively like I had completed something. I can't quite put my finger on what it was, but you arrive and you've finished the Camino. It felt more complete than I thought it was going to. So although I did end up going to Finisterre and Lucia, you know, I'll confess, I didn't actually walk all the way. I took a bus uh, a little bit up the coast and then had, let's say, like a two day walking holiday. So I sort of went around um, first to Finisterre and you know, watched the sunset at the, uh, the end of the world and then uh, took the second day from Finisterre up to Lucia. And that, that kind of took the pressure off. But it also gave me two additional sort of final stages, so to speak, which um, I think helped accustom me to maybe not needing to go walking every day. But uh, it took a while for that urge to sort of end. I got very used on the on the Camino to waking up and being like, right, let's go. It's a new day. There's new places to go and new things to explore. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. And uh Getting to the point where I didn't feel that took quite a while. <laughs> yeah, I think it's it's a really strange thing mentally when you've had that space to just clear your mind, get up in the morning, walk, eat, sleep, then walk again the next day. My mind was very, very clear. <laughs> there was no thoughts in there for quite a while. <laughs> yeah, but it's it's a really weird adjustment, I suppose, now we've just been through lockdowns and coming back out of lockdowns. It's a similar sort of thing, I think, that you, you're you used to having such a busy, full life and then you change your pace so abruptly. And then coming out of that changed pace is is really a strange thing. I, you know, I remember when I came back from Nepal and I, I remember saying to my boss, nothing feels important. And he just laughed and he said, oh, I was like that after I came back from Nepal the first time. It took me about three weeks before I started caring about anything again. I completely understand. It's it's the holiday after the holiday. Although some trips that I've had, I've had what I can only describe as reverse homesickness, where you get (laughs) back and you just wish desperately that you were still out there. I didn't actually have that with the Camino. It felt like I was done. Um, and also, <laughs> yeah. the, the, I think the main thing is that I was no longer returning to, to London and my previous job. I was you know, returning to Cumbria and um, the excitement of a new job. So 
there was something else to actually look forward to, which undoubtedly actually helped. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You weren't returning to something that you knew and you were used to and you could get a bit fed up with again. It's like, actually, you were back. You needed to have a clear head because you've you've got a lot of challenges and you've come in and everything's been really fast and you've had to hit the ground running, as it were. But yeah, what a fantastic way to prepare for a new job. I think they should send everybody on the Camino before you start a new job. I think that's a great idea. I think in many ways, it does a great job of um, clearing the cobwebs of the old work out of your head. So (laughs) I I think I was all ready to uh, get started at Cicerone um, once I got back. And uh, the, the, the old life was now well behind me. Yeah. And I think that's why so many, so many people we, we know through Cicerone do what they do. I think it's quite addictive that being able to put down your regular stresses and worries and just focus on, on walking and enjoying being outside and enjoying the scenery and you know, that that sense of calm you get at the end of a day where you're physically tired, it's a really nice thing to do. And I'm sure that's why people get home from doing a trip and book the next one straight away. I think so. I mean, particularly with uh, the two years of COVID behind us, I had sort of forgotten the sense of joy that you have when you're doing a big, long trip like this, where... You're outside and you're just in the landscape in a way that is quite hard to define otherwise. And it was it was wonderful to connect back to that type of joy again, the joy of um, of travel and experience and doing something slightly ridiculous, but kind of wonderful as well, like walking across Spain. So that's something that I very much want to sort of take forward as well. What a nice place to come to the end of the podcast. That's that's great. <laughs> have you have you booked somewhere for next? Uh, no, no. But I have been doing a lot of thinking. I would like to take my dog on the next trip, wherever that might be. And so I was plotting things on the Camino while I was going, um, thinking, you know, what, what could we do? Is it going to be in the UK? Which probably um how long can it be uh how how much heavier does my rucksack need to be to carry all the dog stuff as well so it's going to be a new challenge with that certainly something that i'm i'm kind of looking forward to thinking more about yeah well that is one thing we are never short of at cicerone when we have new guidebooks landing on our desk every day with oh, I'd never even heard of this place, but now I want to go there. You just have to deal with the the agony of choice. You know, what is it going to be next? Well, it could be anywhere in the world. It's all open for new experiences. Well, that was great. I hope you enjoyed the latest episode of Footnotes, the Cicerone podcast. I'd love to know what you think or if there's anything you'd like us to cover in future episodes please email us on live at cicerone.co.uk or leave a review on your podcast platform. You can follow or subscribe to the podcast to make sure you don't miss new episodes, or you can sign up to our newsletter for all our latest news, events and guidebooks. Visit cicerone.co.uk for further details. We'll be back in a couple of weeks. In the meantime, please feel free to come and join us on our social media channels. We're on all the main ones as at Cicerone Press and we also have a Facebook group Cicerone Connect where you can meet and chat to other outdoor enthusiasts thanks so much for listening we'll see you soon